What's up, everyone? Happy New Year. I know it was New Year's when I did my live stream last week, but this is really, really New Year's. I'm going to open up my uh, video thing here and see if it refreshes so I can look at the comments on here because I'm using my good camera because people kind of uh, complained about the... Um, about the quality, why I'm not in focus, and I have no idea why I'm not in focus on my uh, on my main computer. Okay, so uh, the discount code today is Billy. What is the discount code today for today's live stream? The discount code is RB101. RB101, sixty percent off my Beato book um, transcription bundle, and forty percent off my Piatto Ear Training, and 40% off my Quick Lessons Pro Guitar Course. Don't forget also to follow me on Instagram and follow me on TikTok. I actually have been posting on both those formats again lately. I took about six weeks off, and I talked about this uh, on an Instagram post and on my, my video, um, I think on New Year's Eve, that I had gotten burned out and I wasn't practicing and I'm back to practicing and, and working on new stuff. And it's, um, I'm, I'm re-inspired on the guitar, which is one of the things for, uh, it's one of my new year's resolutions was to get better on the guitar. Um, okay. So I want to talk about this perfection in, in music, this topic that I like to like to discuss. I got an interesting email from, um, a subscriber that made me rethink this. I'm going to read it to you. His name's Ryan McCoskey. And Ryan says, "Just a, Rick, just a quick thought on the idea of something being too perfect. Maybe you've been looking at it backwards. If you look at the original Latin meaning, uh, perfection is a synonym for completion. So you could say removing tempo variations takes the song further away from perfection. Perhaps organic nuance better describes the condition, state, or quality. I mean, better describes this. And when we talk about this, we'll have to put in, talk about auto-tuning, timing, uh, fixing timing discrepancies. In Nashville, they call it pitch and pocketing, right? Uh, that means auto-tuning and beat detecting. Now, let me just give you a little, some things to think about. So historically, recordings in the, in the, you know, starting from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, many times used studio musicians. We saw from the Beatles documentary that the Beatles actually played their own parts. But many of the times, I did a Christopher Cross song this past week um, on a uh, video about how you can't hear the guitar solo at the end of Ride Like the Wind. Um, and if you look on the album notes, you see Larry Carlton played guitar solos on there. Jay Graydon played guitar solos. Um, it, it's full of session players. Eric Johnson, the first time I ever heard of him, he's on one of the tracks, Minstrel Gigolo's last track on the record. This is 1979. And there's a whole thing about yacht rock, right? And, and this included bands, and I don't like that term, but... Bands like Steely Dan, bands like Toto, bands like Chris, people like Christopher Cross, artists like that, Kenny Loggins, Loggins and Messina, I mean, all these things that that had a very high level of performance or had Michael McDonald singing on them because this was the era of the session musician. But the era of the session musician was even before then. Okay, so let me just talk about about some session players. Let me give, give a shout out to some session people. Anytime you see their names on records, for example, drummers, Bernard Purdy, Steve Gadd, Jeff Beccaro, Matt Chamberlain, Josh Freeze, Russ Kunkel, Manu Cache, Vinnie Caliuta, Rick and Jerry Murata. You see these guys on records all the time. They played on so many records. If they're credited on a record, they probably played drums on a lot of it. Many of the times, if they were with writers like Peter Gabriel, or they played with Sting, they are, then they're listed as performers on there. But in rock music, around um, it, it was kind of taboo to, to have session drummers. They always wanted to give the impression that it was the 
people in the band playing the instruments. I mean, Nirvana was Dave Grohl playing the drums. And Soundgarden had Matt Cameron playing the drums because these guys were phenomenal players, okay? I'm, ta I'm not talking about other instruments. But let me talk about bass players, session bass players. Carol Kay, right? Um, Chuck Rainey, James Jamerson. These people were on thousands of recordings and, and there's many, many other great session bass players or, or guitar players, session guitar players. Many of these people have been on my channel. Larry Carlton, Tim Pierce, Steve Lukather, Dean Parks, Jay Graydon. These people are on thousands of records, right? And why did they get hired? They got hired because you didn't have Pro Tools back then to fix parts. So one of the things that, that happened, Lee Scalar. Lee Scalar is on as many recordings. Ron Carter as a sideman. But Lee got, got picked to play because Lee played great parts. In addition to, not, to playing them with incredible precision and tone, he was able to come up with the parts. That's actually what all these people were able to do. If you watch Tim Pierce's channel and you see Tim play guitar parts, demonstrate all these different techniques that he's learned over the years of how to play in the pocket, of how to play solos, of how to come up with parts, things like that. If you listen to the Larry Carlton solos that I played from the Christopher Cross record last week, or you watch my videos on Kid Charlemagne, or uh, Don't Take Me Alive, Larry Carlton things, or, you know... Or you have people like Brian May that play phenomenally great solos, or David Gilmore, or Peter Frampton, or Jimmy Page that don't need session players. Jimmy Page was a session player, so was John Paul Jones. They were session musicians. They didn't need people to come in and play their parts. So there was a mix of this. It was a lot of times it was solo artists, and the solo artists would have people that that uh, would come in and and be their performers on the records and make the records with them and come up with the parts for them. Okay. Um, Tony Levin is another great bass player that I, I had the pleasure of working with years ago. That's that just fantastic. He's on a million records and um, beyond King Crimson. A lot of these people had their own groups that they were in as well, but they played tons and tons of sessions. Okay, so I started thinking about this, this, this idea of perfection and organic nuance. So... Is it really perfection? Can you imagine Thelonious Monk, if you guys know who the great jazz pianist is? Imagine his performance is quantized. Or Eddie Van Halen. Or Bernard Purdy or John Bonham. I tried to quantize the John Bonham drum part and it was it was terrible. It sounded horrible. So why did this happen? When did this start happening? Okay, so I, I've talked about Auto-Tune. Auto-Tune started around 1998, and then Beat Detective was added to Pro Tools, which is, Pro Tools is pretty much what most people used as for production, for rock music production, for, for every kind of production. It wasn't until much later that people started using Logic and Cubase and things like that. Pro Tools was pretty much the industry standard. You know, for movie scores and things, it's still the industry standard. But nowadays, people use all different types of DAWs. Okay. Um, so, but Beat Detective was added because people were going in and chopping up things and, and fixing them. They were fixing the, the tempos of drummers to a grid. So they would pick a tempo of the song. They'd say, okay, uh, the tempo is 96. I showed this in... Um, one of my videos recently where I was playing an Audio Slave song that was produced by Rick Rubin, and the tempo was 96. It was uh, 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 what was the tune? Billy, do you remember what the tune was? It was um, I can't remember. I'll think of it. it wasn't Cochise though, but um, but it was flatlined. It was it was a steady tempo because it had been quantized. Now. That's just a choice on the producer. The producer is uh, is the one that's saying that they should do that. They didn't have to do that, though. Brendan O'Brien, that produced records with uh, you know Pearl Jam, Rage Against the Machine, all these great records that happened in the in the late '80s, from the Black Crows to uh, Dog Man by King's X, uh, Stunt Double Pilots. 
Brendan never quantized anything. He worked on tape. He the yeah, if there was a little uh, tempo variation or something, a little late kick drum or something, they cut a little bit out of the 24 track when they were doing the, doing the editing uh, and putting together a drum take. And they might take a verse from one song and from another song, but it's in an imperfect sci science because it's done on tape, okay? And the tape's not really necessarily playing back perfectly all the time. So why is it that people started using beat detective and correcting drums and making them imperfect actually we'll, we'll say and and start using autotune well i can tell you from my personal experience and i've always copped to this that when when a band would come in they get signed to a record deal and their drummer wasn't good enough which would happen probably about 70 percent of the time maybe more. The producers didn't want to work with these drummers. They didn't even care to use, to try to use the drummers because they had their own guy or girl or woman that would come in and play the drum parts as a session player. Okay. So these, when they did that, it was, they would know that they would get great drum parts and that they didn't have to fix them that much. They would still edit them, even if they were session people, that it just got to be the thing where they would just edit drum parts that were played incredibly well to make them perfect. One of the reasons they did this was so that they could cut and paste sections to give the producer more control over the sound of the recording. So this really comes back to control of things like this. Um, you know what, there's a better fill on this particular performance. And they're all quantized, so you can just literally take two bars out, pop it in. Let's grab that fill from the third chorus. That's, let's use that in the first verse. You know what, let's just slide it back and just use part of the fill. I've demonstrated this in videos before. It's incredibly easy because you basically have a drum machine. That's exactly what it is. It's literally, it's live performance that's been quantized and it becomes a drum machine, okay? And it takes all the feel out of things. I made the video about the Jonas Brothers tune. Uh, what was it, Sucker? That uh, the guy from the New York Times was saying how this was an amazing drum break. It had it. Uh, it was like James Brown, and I was like, no, it's nothing like James Brown because James Brown wasn't played to a click track. So it had organic nuance. Um, so I started thinking about this. I wrote down some notes here. The shift of quantizing drummers and auto-tuning had to do, there was a certain financial element of this that had to do with, um, with the A&R people. When downsizing started happening in the music business around 2005, A&R people, the people that would sign bands and make records, most of the heads of A&R would get fired because they would typically have salaries. If you were the head of A&R of, let's say, Columbia Records, you'd probably make 750 grand a year. And the record sales, or lack of them, because of uh, uh, downloading, because of Napster, didn't support salaries like that anymore. It literally did not. So those people got wiped out. And then it was lower level A&R with one head of A&R and then the label president, typically. The people I would interface with would be the A&R person, the head of A&R typically when I would make a record that was a major label record. So the A&R people wanted to be the people in charge saying that, well, I picked all the songs. I picked the drummer. Um, I picked the producer. And this was about control, about ego. And this was really a big problem. Now, I was just trying to make a living doing this. And what they didn't want to do is they didn't want the drummer to quit because historically what would happen when the drummer didn't play on the record, they would usually quit the band. If you go back and look at bands that got signed, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, mid 90s, of the 90s, the 80s, whatever, you'd go and you'd see different drummers that played uh, that they would quit. The drummers that get signed with the band typically wouldn't be with the band because once the producers came in and said, you know, your drummer kind of sucks and so we're going to get a session guy to play on it. Then the drummers ticked off. Then the guys in the band are thinking, oh man, he's, he's not even good enough to play on the record. 
and then they would hire somebody else. So there would be this constant turnover. Well, the labels didn't want to deal with that because they would sign record deals with the people in the band, or in some cases, they just sign the singer. And there's bands that I've worked with that, uh, that only had a singer, even though they, they looked like they were a band. And I've talked about these bands on here. So they would, um, they would bring someone in, uh, or instead of bringing someone in, they would beat detect the terrible drummer. Okay? They just would. And you'd use a thing, like I would say, okay, give me some samples. Give me a good flam. And I would use these things when they'd play an inconsistent flam. When they play an inconsistent snare hit, i take the sample of the whole drum kit, take that one sample out. I have a bunch of different velocities that I have them play, and I would just replace it instead of having a session drummer come in and play. It then it Because now it had gotten to the point where there was no budget for a session drummer. So the session drummers were getting paid less even, or they weren't getting hired at all, right? Think about this. When I went through the top 20, or I'm sorry, the 10 songs that are Song of the Year, how many of them had real string arrangements on them? When's the last time you heard a real string arrangement on a song? Maybe there's one. I can't think of it. That's That was a hit song. Like a real string arrangement. Like Seal. Like on uh, Kiss from a Rose. A phenomenal, phenomenal string arrangement. Or Drops of Jupiter by Train. If you, I have Plenty of people hate Train, but that's a great string arrangement by Paul Buckmaster. Well, people don't play, don't do those things. They cost too much. You can just get a synthesizer to play them. Just program them. You got Spitfire Audio. You got East West Strings. Whatever it is, I, I like Spitfire Audio. Um, okay, so, uh, so the A and R people. So it was. We don't have the budgets to hire session players. We don't want the drummers to quit. So just fix their parts. We want the producer to be able to play parts as much as possible and fix the, the people's things. So when I'm making a record, if the guitar player can't play consistently and can't play with his guitar in tune, I have to fix it. I mean, that was just the thing because I'm getting paid to make a great record because the label's paying me and the band's paying me. But there's a, there's a thing there. It's like the band has to be like the record that they make, which is why I, this was the worst part of it for me. And I would try to teach the groups to play better, to play in time, to play consistently, and to play in tune. Okay? This is why uh, I think a lot of rock music became fell out of favor. As you start quantizing and auto-tuning things, there you start losing all the nuances. Blues notes. Think of all the bluesy new metal songs there are. You can keep thinking because there are none. <laughs> <laughs> it's none. There are no blues notes. There's no BB Kings. You know, there's no blues singing in new metal. And pretty much all new metal is quantized. It is. Pretty much all metal that you hear on these Spotify top 10 or countdowns that I've done and rock bands that I've done over the past year and a half or so, it's all quantized. It is. It's become the natural state of things. Have I fixed drums? Of course I've fixed drums, millions of times. I've done it myself. This is my payback here is to teach people on this channel for to, to uh, atone for my the sins of, of doing things like that and adding to, the, to this kind of stuff. Um, it's nothing that I really liked, but I did it pretty much like most people did um, because that was my job and it had to sound good. And for some, and then I got to a point where the A&R guys, if it wasn't perfect, even the people in the bands, they wanted their stuff fixed. They wanted auto-tune on their voices. It's unbelievable. I have bands that I worked with. They had phenomenal singers. Hey, can you put auto-tune on my voice? And there's a plug-in. You just do it live. You just put the plug-in on auto on, on the track, tune it to the key of the song, and there it does. And and then when it get to words where you could hear it, you just turn it off for a second and turn it back on. Or then you go in and spot fix it or whatever, you know. Or you take out Melodyne 
And Melodyne's a program where you feed the whole thing in. Well, you can do that with Auto Tune Nine. You feed the whole part in there, and uh, and then you fix it. And you fix the timing, and you fix the pitch of it, along to a grid that you can see. I've made videos about all this stuff. Um, I um, I'm going to mention my sale one more. Since I don't ever do ads on my channel, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna, here's my ad. If you want to support the channel and become a better musician, check out my Beato book um, bundle. It, uh, that's a 700 page PDF, 60% off with the discount code RB101. If you want to get a, develop a better ear so you can hear when things are out of tune, uh, check out my Beato ear training. And if you want to improve your guitar skills and, um, and, get new ideas for playing, check out my Beato um, Quick Lessons Pro Guitar Course. Okay, So those are ways that you improve yourself as a musician and you can support the channel. Because this is, the whole thing here is to teach people how to teach themselves ultimately, right? Okay, so, so, I told you I've been posting on TikTok, and one of the people that I follow on TikTok is Charlie Puth. Now, Charlie Puth is a pop singer. I like Charlie Puth's TikTok because it's like a production TikTok. And one of the things that cracks me up about this is Charlie Puth has perfect pitch, and he heavily auto-tunes his voice. So you, I wonder, like, why does Charlie Puth, and I, it doesn't bother me, I like the sound of it. Why does Charlie Puth auto-tune his voice? Right? I mean... Why? Why do you auto-tune your voice if you have perfect pitch? Um, because he likes the sound of it. I mean, ultimately. Why does he like the sound of it? Because it sounds like what pop records sound like nowadays. Because it's on everything. And at a certain point, right, Billy? What? <laughs> I mean, that's why he auto-tunes it. Yeah. Because he likes the sound of it. I mean, he doesn't need it auto-tuned, obviously. Charlie sings incredibly in tune. Um, but I still want, I always think about this, like, why is a guy with perfect pitch auto-tuning his voice? He knows exactly where the pitch of the notes are, and he's got incredibly good pitch. Uh, but it sounds weird without it to him, because every record he listens to that's a pop record of the last, I mean, he's in his 20s, so probably the last 10 years since he was a kid, has that auto-tune all over it. So, um, so that kind of, um, that makes me think that that's really fascinating to me about that. And there is a place for auto-tune. I am not anti-auto-tune. I'm anti using auto-tune on every single song because ultimately there will be a point where people come back and say, why did I put auto-tune on everything? It's like, it's basically like people that have too much cosmetic surgery or that Photoshop everything, Photoshop every picture. At a certain point, you got to just say, okay, this is where I am at this time. This is why you make records. It's a recording. It's, it's a, a record of where you were at a particular time. And if you learn anything from watching the Beatles get back, it's that they were playing stuff in the studio and singing live takes. And that's what they did for a lot of their career. All the early records were done that way. And people used to do that. Look at pictures of Bob Dylan in the studio. I mean, maybe Bob's a bad example. But, you know, think of all the early 70s people, Gordon Lightfoot, Jim Croce, um, Cat Stevens, all these great players. Frampton Comes Alive, Peter Frampton singing these incredible takes live while playing guitar and playing the most amazing guitar solos. Uh, imagine Stevie Wonder auto-tuned. Why would Stevie Wonder need to be auto-tuned? He doesn't need to be auto-tuned, right? Just like Albert King. Could Albert King be auto-tuned? Stevie Ray Vaughan, would he be auto-tuned or be, you know, pitch corrected? I mean, obviously this is uh, um, the level of performer in order to be a performer on a record when you were recording on tape, you needed to be of a higher caliber of a player to do that. 
Yet today we have some of the highest calibers, technically, players. Go on Instagram and, and watch some of the guitar players, bass players. Oh, my God. There's amazing, incredible young players, incredible old players. There's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. People that weren't... Um, People that weren't lucky enough to live in Los Angeles and make records, right? That could have been session players. Uh, I'm going to answer some of the super chats here. Uh, I'm going to go back here. Uh, Wayne Wood says, learning a lot from your channel. Thank you so much for teaching. The is incredible, helpful. Thank you, Wayne Wood. Appreciate that. Um, Doc Jules, 11. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Billy, how do I find all my super chats here? I'm here too. Okay. Baby Yoda gave you $5. Baby Yoda, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, Rath gave you 28 Said, Rick, any favorite notation software? Guess I'll try Dorico. I don't know what that is. I, I You know, we Billy and I use um, Guitar Pro, mm -hmm. and we use Sibelius. I own Finale, but it's very difficult to use. Um, it's very difficult to use. I don't know why. It's it's just not um, out of all of them. Billy, if you had to say, and I always ask Billy this stuff because Billy's an expert at this stuff. Billy, what's can compare Guitar Pro and Sibelius? Well, Guitar Pro is obviously more for guitar tablature. Yeah, what what it's easier. Anybody can learn oh, Guitar oh my Pro. God. Though. Guitar Pro's navigation and key commands and stuff are so easy. Yeah, Guitar Pro is so far beyond. If Guitar Pro could do things, uh, you know, with really pro looking, the only thing the Sibelius has on it is the, the type of fonts and things like that that you can do. That's the that's it. But the the legend that it has, where you click, and and use key commands to put notes in, there's nothing that's 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 uh, that compares to it. Frankly, there really isn't. Uh, any other super chats, Billy? Oh yeah. Okay. First, Weisendanger. Yeah. I see it here. In the 80s, we used tons of verb. In today's auto-tune, it's style. True, true. But um, but reverb is a is a spatial effect. Auto-tune is a pitch effect. Reverb doesn't take out the nuance of a person's voice. Okay? Reverb is, is things that you put the voice in to enhance it, but you're not enhancing the pitch and making it sound digitized. I mean, what is the difference between... I mean, if I had, some of the things are so heavily auto-tuned. Let me just go back to this. Like Ed Sheeran, who's an excellent singer. And Ed uses very heavy auto-tune because that's the style that he likes, or at least the producers that he works with like. And um, and why couldn't you just get a bunch of words from Ed and just put it on a keyboard and, and just play the melodies? Well, you could, really. And ultimately, that's where it's going to go. Because why you actually need a real singer if, if you're going to auto-tune every note and it's perfectly in pitch with, with a grid, why do you need a real singer to do that? Why not just create a program to do that? Well, people are already, that's what they're doing. They're creating programs to, to just recreate things and you'll have AI do it. That's going to happen. It's already happening. It's going to happen. Billy, what? I got more. Okay, go ahead. Um, Bart de Beauzeblanc. Yep. Said, Rick, you were saying it's not modern music. It is technological. Automating the process can make music sound too manufactured. This is even true of purely electronic music. It's, a, it's correct. Yeah. Um, but a lot, this is really done for convenience, right? Let's be real. Let's be realistic on it. Why, why do people use um, simulated amplifiers? Why would you need a simulated amplifier? Well, I don't need a simulated amplifier. I've got a few amps. I know how to record. I have an ISO booth and mics and mic pre's. Most people that live in houses don't have the... Well, you can do it if you live... If you have a basement, you can do that. But most people don't want to do that because they don't have the experience to know what a good guitar sound is. Because you typically have to make records to know what good guitar sounds. That's why you have recording engineers. They know how to get guitar sounds. They know how to get the mics in phase. They know how to how to the, what the tone is supposed to be. They know how to layer things and get things to have their own frequency ranges. This is a whole art, right? It's much easier to plug in my Axe Effects or my 
quad cortex or my helix or my Kemper. Way easier to do that. Sound in a box, right? Already EQ'd, already mic'd, already put through a speaker, but a digital version of that. Um, taking the, once again, taking the art of recording out of it. So you don't need to learn how to choose a guitar sound, get your amplifier sounding right, find the right mic placement, get the mic pre's in phase uh, if you're using two mics, get the recording levels right, Make you got it. What if one of your speakers is blown and you don't even realize it? You know, there's so many parts of this that can go wrong. It's very easy. Just dial in your EVH three sound. Already has the modeled cabinet on it. Oh, you know what? I'd like to let me switch the cabinet. So let me use this IR thing. Right. Very easy to do that. And what that does is you have all these people using the same algorithm, so they have the same sounds, essentially, right? They use the same algorithms. If, if you're using the same boxes, you're using the same algorithms. Now, if I open up an Axe Effects, that's got, you can spend weeks programming a sound, but you could spend five minutes with your pedals just tweaking them. When I had Eric Johnson come to the studio here, I handed Eric some of the pedals that he uses. I have all these pedals. And he made up a little pedal board in five minutes. And I had two deluxes here. He plugged them in. I should have recorded him on camera, but it was so fast that he dialed up his tone. He just ch -ch 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 got his guitar out and was playing. Billy, you were here for that, right? Yeah, like, like two minutes. We couldn't even turn the camera on fast enough. He's like, okay, that'll work. Mm -hmm. It was great. That's all he needed to do. Um, he knew what, it, what, what, his, what he wanted for his sound, and he did it. That's Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson is a genius, brilliant when it comes to sounds. Jimmy Page, right? These guys know. Jimmy Page produced every Zeppelin record. He knows the sounds that he wanted to hear. It's also his 78th birthday today. Jimmy Page's 78th birthday. Happy birthday, Jimmy. I want to interview you one day, Jimmy, Mr. Page. <laughs> that would be, I could quit my channel then if that happened. Um, I mean, if I pretty much interviewed McCartney and Jimmy Page and David Gilmore and Jeff Beck and, and uh, Clapton and, uh, and I'm going to interview Brian May um in person I, I have interviewed brian but if if i could interview all those people i could pretty much just about hang up my channel i want to interview uh i want to interview people like herbie hancock too i want to interview i want to interview uh i mean there's so many players that i want to interview so many jazz players i want to do the ron my ron carter interview in person i interviewed ron over skype but i really want to do one in person i want to hear I want to get, I've met Ron in person, but I want to hear Ron's vibe in an interview where he has his bass. Um, Dr. Rob Allen, love your work and spirit. Keep it up, sir. Okay, so um, somebody said Paul Rogers, Pete Townsend. I want, to I want to interview all those people. There's just so many people I want to interview. Um, I just don't have the... Um, I don't have the connections to get to the people. I don't. I'm sorry. Subscribe to my channel. If you guys aren't subscribed, that actually helps. Okay? If I had 3 million subscribers on my channel, I know it sounds ridiculous. And I don't really tell people to subscribe very often, but the that actually helps my... When, when publicists are looking at this and they're looking at my channel and they're trying to decide, should Jimmy Page go and do an interview with this magazine or should he go on this YouTube channel with this white-haired dude? Well, that white-haired dude only has 2.7 million subscribers. If he had 3 million or 5 million, be like, maybe we'll go there. So follow me on Instagram too, Rick Beato one and TikTok, if you guys are on TikTok. Okay, so... Once again, interview with Mark Knopfler. I'm seeing all these things on here, and I always go back through. I have a whole list of things. I want to interview James Hetfield. I want to interview all the, all my metal 
people that I love, all my metal musicians that I love, all my all the rockers. You know, I want to interview all the grunge people: Eddie Vedder, Dave Grohl, Matt Cameron, uh, everybody that's you know, Jerry Cantrell. I want to interview all those all those people, and and hopefully. Neil Schoen, I want to interview. I love Neil. Um, Slash and Axel would be amazing. Bono and the Edge would be amazing. Mick and Keith would be amazing. We'll see if those can happen. Um, and I see Michael Stipe on there. Oh, my God. I love R.E.M. Massive fan of R.E.M. Never met any of the guys. And they're, you know, um, I think a couple of them are still in Athens. It's just an hour from here, 45 minutes. So anyways, well, I'm just going to give you my pitch one more time. The um, Instead of doing, uh, instead of having sponsored videos, I sponsor with my own ads, which is my own instructional uh, courses that I've developed. My Beato ear training that'll teach you how to have great relative pitch and figure out any song by ear. My... Uh, Beato book music theory um, book with the with the bundle transcription bundle that goes with it 700 page PDF and then my Beato quick lessons pro guitar course which has five hours of 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 ideas and concepts I call it nonlinear learning um, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about here is that um, I do shorts on Instagram on YouTube. And YouTube doesn't push shorts out to my subscribers. They don't. It's a different thing. They don't. Um, I don't know why they don't. But they don't. Check out my shorts. I've been post posting shorts on here. Um, and for some reason, the, the most... People that I know, all my guitar player YouTube friends post shorts and people don't realize that they have shorts. And it YouTube is not really connecting people that follow the channels with these things. These are where I do my quick lessons, stuff like that. But I'm going to keep posting them and uh, hopefully you guys will catch on and watch them. Anyways, so this is something I thought about. This was a really insightful uh, email that I got from um, from Ryan about the uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, thinking about this wrong and uh, I think he's right about that organic nuance that's the thing that I'm looking for I don't hate Autotune. I know somebody that works for Antares, which makes Autotune. And he says, Rick, why do you hate Autotune so much? <laughs> I say, I don't hate Autotune. I don't hate Autotune. Autotune is great in some things. There's some songs that, that actually I really like the Autotune part of them. So there we go. Uh, you guys are amazing. Leave the comments. Tell me what you think about this. Um, I have a, a series of New Year's resolutions that I'm going to talk about some more, but one of them is I'm practicing more. I'm going to have more female artists on my channel this year. I'm going to do more interviews this year. I'm going to do more What Makes This Song Great. So I have a new one on Blink-182 that um, that is on another song off Enema of the State. Um, and... Uh, check it out. I started my series with Blink-182, believe it or not. What makes a song great? 110 episodes ago. The first episode was four years ago. It was late January that I did it. So four years ago, next week or the week after. Four-year anniversary of What Makes a Song Great. So I'm going to do more. I've done very few. And I've done very few lately because uh, it's, it, once again, it's just difficult to, to know what is going to... Um, what is going to get blocked or not okay you guys are the best we'll uh we'll see you next week okay have a great 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 week